Hello, this is John from caveofprogramming.com and in this video we're going to talk about parallel streams and lazy evaluation. At this point in the course I was going to insert a video about collectors and we are going to tackle that but what I realised was that stuff is going to make a lot more sense if we first take a look at parallel streams. And let's start by taking a look at the idea of lazy evaluation. So I'm going to create a simple stream here. Let's use int stream dot range. And let's have just a small range of numbers here. Let's say from zero to five. And then we'll have a for each. And I'm going to use system dot out colon colon print line. Add the import for int stream. Actually, we've already got it and run this. And it does, of course, what you expect. But now I want to examine exactly how this is working. So what I'm interested in is the question of if I have another intermediate operation immediately after range, and if that operation actually prints out the elements of the stream, in what order will they appear in the console? So I could use map for this. I could have a Lambda expression that just maps the element to itself. So we could put in here some kind of thing that ultimately returns I so it has no effect on it. And then we'd be able to put in there something like a system.out.println like this, and I could print out I. That's the effect that I want to achieve. But in fact, because this is such a common thing to do for debugging purposes, there is actually a dedicated method to do it, and it's called peak. So of course, this would have no effect on the element, all it will do is print the element out, and that's what we want here. So let's change this to peak, and then we don't actually have to bother with most of this stuff. We can just actually put in a method reference to system.out colon colon print line, and that will get invoked without changing the element. So that's a pretty useful method for debugging. Now I want to ask you at this point, what will we actually see if we run this? Because you might think, that, well, what's going to happen is this is going to generate the elements 0 through to and including 4. Then this is going to print out 0 up to 4. And then this is going to print out 0 up to 4. And if you think that, well, you're mistaken. It's actually quite surprising if you've not thought about this before. But if we run this, what we actually get is 00112233444. So it's as if each element that's created is being generated and then it's passing through the whole pipeline and eventually being printed out. And then the next element passes through the entire pipeline and is printed out and so on. So in general, streams have this lazy evaluation thing going on, whereby each element does not go through any particular phase of processing until the last minute, until it's absolutely needed. So we don't collect things all together all at the same time and then process them and then process them some more. It's as if the elements are proceeding through the pipeline one after the other only when each one is absolutely needed. Now this is a really important thing to understand especially because it kind of helps us focus on the idea that the stream pipeline that is the sequence of operations are something that process an individual element. And yes, they ultimately process multiple elements, all the elements in the stream, but they're doing that one at a time. So particularly when we write parallel streams, which we're going to look at, we want to think in terms of just processing one single element at a time. So each intermediate operation will have some effect on an element without having side effects. So it's not going to alter something somewhere else. Like we're not going to add the elements to some list as we go along or delete them from some list. What we ideally want, especially in a context of parallel streams, is we want the situation where each operation does what it has to do with the element and that has no side effects and then the element continues on its way. And by the way, this actually does have side effects because it's printing the elements out. So it's not a great example of that. But hopefully you understand what I'm talking about. We want to think of this as a situation where we process each element, nothing else happens, and then it goes on its way through the stream pipeline. By the way, if you can hear music, then apologies for that. That's the ice cream shop downstairs. Now let's take a look at how we can create parallel streams. 
There are actually two ways to create parallel streams. One is that the stream interface has a method called parallel, and the other is that the collection interface has a method called parallel stream. We can create parallel streams using either of those. And what actually are parallel streams? Well, we'll get onto that, but let's investigate this a little bit. I'm going to copy this and let's paste a copy of it down here. Indent that. I'm going to have a blank line here so we can separate the output a bit more clearly. And let's change this just to print so that we don't get lots of lines taken up in the output. And maybe let's do the same here as well. So if you look at what we've got now, we've got this. So this is from here and then we've got the same thing again. Now these are sequential streams. So we are processing the elements one after the other. And one advantage of that is that the elements are kept in the order in which we generate them in the first place. But that's not always what we want. The computer that I'm using has more than one CPU and that means it's capable of doing more than one thing at a time. So if we're doing a lot of processing in a stream or we have a lot of elements, it might be more efficient if we can process the elements of the stream simultaneously on the different cores of the computer, the different CPUs. And we can facilitate that by inserting in here dot parallel. Now let's take a look at the output and if we run it, what we're going to see is that the output is not now in any predictable order. What this is actually going to do is it's going to create multiple different streams and they are going to run at the same time. So because we can't control which elements go into which stream or when each of the multiple streams finish, we now no longer know what order we're going to receive them in at the end. But for many purposes, that's absolutely fine. We don't know here how many streams have been created. There are some rules of thumb, but last time I tried this, it didn't seem like Java was following these alleged rules of thumb. And what I would say is that in general, don't worry about it. If you find that you need to control the number of threads that are being created, or you need some kind of predictable order for the elements, then you probably don't want a stream. You probably want something that isn't stream based. But this is a way, if you don't care about the order of the elements, that you can potentially speed up processing in your stream by portioning work out onto multiple CPUs if you've got them. If your computer only has one core, it only has one CPU, which these days is probably unlikely, then there is still a situation in which this might result in your processing being speeded up. But that's quite an unusual situation. And that would be where you're waiting on something external. Like for example, one of the methods in your stream pipeline is downloading information from the internet. Then in that case, even if you've got only one CPU, Parallel might give you a speed up because that would enable the multiple different streams to download different bits of information from the internet at the same time instead of waiting for each other sequentially. But I think by far the most common use of this is just to help ensure that work is parceled out onto multiple different CPUs. And it's very important to remember that if we do make use of parallelism in our streams, then we want to be very careful about the operations in the pipeline having side effects. We don't want them modifying some list or something because then the multiple streams will try to modify the list at the same time and that can result in some problems that will crash your program, like for example concurrent modification exceptions. Let's just take a look at an example where the parallel method will give us a big speed up simply because we're waiting for something to happen and it's going to be faster to have multiple streams waiting for that thing at the same time rather than waiting for that thing sequentially. So I'm going to copy this and let's paste this down here. And in app, I'm going to create a method we can use. Let's have a private static void wait for something. And we're just going to fake this. So instead of downloading something from the internet or whatever, I'm just going to put a timer in here so that we can pretend we're doing that. Let's have a thread dot sleep and sleep for 1000 milliseconds or one second. So I'm going to click the error here and add a surround with try catch so that we don't have to worry about that. And now in the peak, let's just use peak. So you can imagine that we're using 
map or something and this is doing something actually useful but here since it isn't doing anything actually useful we're just going to carry on using peak for this and in here I'm going to write at colon colon wait for something and now since this has to receive elements from the stream since it's a consumer I'm going to put int i up here even though we're not using it at the moment okay so let's take a look at this and let's maybe increase this to 10 seconds and see what it does and to start with, I'm going to run it with the parallel commented out. So if we run this, how long is it going to take to run? Well, it's going to take 10 seconds to run. We've got to process those items one at a time because every time we're waiting for a second and we've got to wait for each item to finish before we can process it. But if we now turn this into a parallel stream and we run it, it's going to go much faster. The downside being that the elements are not going to be in the same order anymore. So you can see from how rapidly this executed that we must have been running like three or four threads or something at the same time. So the other way that we can create a parallel stream is with the parallel stream method of the collection interface. Let's say, for example, we have a list. Let's try list.off and we'll have some strings in here just for a change. One, two, three, four. I'll add the import for list. And this by itself would, of course, give us a immutable list, one that we can't change. But I can turn it into a parallel stream with the parallel stream method. And then we can do for each on it to have a look at them. And if we run this, eventually we get our elements. The output's a little bit disordered here. Let's maybe just put a sys out there. Let's change that to print and run it again. And you can see we've got three, four, two, one. So the definitely not in the same order because the order that we're going to end up printing them in is just going to depend on how quickly each of the separate parallel streams finishes. So this is a useful trick to have up your sleeve and the reason I wanted to mention this at this point in the course is because we're going to go on to look at collectors and one of the methods in a collector just makes no sense unless you understand that parallel streams exist. Don't forget you can register free to my website and then you get access to some free courses as well as being able to pay for the premium courses if you happen to want those. Now join me again next time when we'll be looking further at mutable reduction operations in the form of collectors. And until next time, happy coding.